Hi, I'm Dennis Messler, and welcome to The Charge. Today, we are taking a look at Christian ethics with Dr. D. Stephen Long. He's a professor of ethics at Southern Methodist University and the author of Christian Ethics, A Very Short Introduction, written back in 2010. Follow the link. The book is available below. So, uh, Dr. Long, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dennis. Pleasure to be here and chat with you. All right. So the first thing I noticed about this book, whenever I see books that are like very short introduction, I don't get my hopes up. I, my general experience is more like they're going to say the same things that everybody said that it's like I've heard this before, but I was amazed by in such a short volume how profound and deep and, and broad it was. Um, so I was very encouraged by it. And uh, so... To start with, how about you tell us something about yourself in terms of your uh, church theology tradition and then uh, how, why you wrote the book in the first place. Sure. Um, I was baptized by the Anabaptists in Goshen, Indiana, and then I was educated by the evangelicals at Taylor University in Indiana. I uh, went to seminary with the Methodists and was ordained and imordained as a Methodist elder and when I finished my PhD, the only people who would hire me were the Jesuits. So I have a very eclectic, perhaps confused, maybe ecumenical background. Uh, but it also, I, th I hope, is reflected in my theology in that I have strong interests in almost all of those traditions, either when they are functioning well or when they are not functioning well. The, this book came into existence like all the very short introductions because of an invitation. Uh, in the Oxford series of very short introductions, you're invited to uh, to write one. You can't submit a proposal like most books. So I was asked to do this, and it seemed like such a good opportunity. to. It, it's a difficult task to take what you think about ethics and distill it into about 100 pages. It's an almost an impossible task. So I had to really reflect on what matters most, what do I want to say, how can I say it in an intelligible way. And it's because it's an impossible task, it's almost always insufficient. So this book is really a promissory note on a book that I've been working on since that time called uh, Infusing Virtue, Learning and Teaching Ethics, which I hope will be out next year. It expands on some of the things that can basically only be assertions in this book because you can't provide the evidence for them. <clears throat> all right. Well, I look forward to that volume coming out. Uh, all right. So you you make this uh, this comment, keep ethics safe from Christianity and keep Christianity safe from ethics. So can you explain what that means? I can. I, I saw that statement, and um, I think I use the term preserve, but safe also works uh, just as well. And that has to do with the relationship between theology and ethics, or God and the good. And sometimes ethics, as a philosophical discipline, can be taught in such a way that it actually tries to preserve people from anything that's transcendent. It assumes that nature is self-sufficient on its own. There's a kind of imminence, and we have all the internal sources that we need. So we don't need any kind of transcendent gift, uh, it, whether it be God or even so, something, something else, like Plato's account of what the good is. So ethics becomes a way of, of actually keeping people from having to think about things like transcendence and God. That emerged, I think, in the mid part of the 19th century when ethics became an academic discipline on its own. It became an autonomous discipline, and it was assumed that, uh, like other disciplines, it had its own domain of human action that could be separated from questions of theology, metaphysics, politics, and economics. I think that's a mistake. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes we try to keep Christianity uh, safe from ethics, suggesting that, uh, well, maybe it, it's aethical. Uh, we can't really <clears throat> evaluate Christianity based upon ethical uh, categories because it's a religion of revelation, and uh, therefore it's all about faith and not about reason. I think that's also deeply problematic, and that allows us to do things that uh, gives us permission, if you will, to... Uh, to be unethical in our Christianity. We have all the answers with Christianity, therefore we can do whatever we want to do 
and uh, you know we can be Christian nationalists, we can do whatever, uh, and we don't have to be held accountable. So I want to, as a moral theologian or a Christian ethicist, I want, I don't want to abandon either the task of theology, uh, nor do I want to abandon the task of ethics. I want to bring them into a, what I hope is a fruitful conversation. And before we get into scripture, um, you take a, a brief look at theology, uh, particularly uh, the Trinity and the Incarnation. So um, why did you pick those two as relating to ethics? Right. God is not an object in the world to be indicated. You can't point at it and say, oh, that's God. Uh, in, in essence, uh, God is not just one more item of belief. So if there is a God, and a God, not just a bare theistic God, but a God in the rich sense of what the Christian tradition suggests, then it seems to me that it changes everything. Uh, so, you know, once you get over the idea of God, everything has to be viewed in, in a new way. For that reason, it seems to me that ethics can't be conceived of separate from or apart from those basic convictions. And in the Christian tradition, those convictions have to do with the two great mysteries. The fundamental uh, mystery is that we worship Jesus as God without confusing humanity and divinity. And that's complicated. How do we do that? Well, one of the ways we do that is we explain it. We try to explain it as much as a mystery can be explained. We 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 point towards it uh, by suggesting the doctrines of the incarnation and the doctrines of the Trinity. That those doctrines are actually intrinsic to the core practice of the Christian life, which is that we worship Jesus as God. And without that, Christianity doesn't make any sense. But if that does make sense, then it's it has to have an influence on ethics. You can't you, you can't affirm that and then suggest that, well, we can just go about doing ethics any way we want as if that didn't matter. That changes everything. And you also talk about how pagan wisdom and virtue are a source for Christian ethics. Can you say more about that? That's a great follow-up question because it deals precisely with that quote that you've identified about not, about not trying to abandon either ethics or uh, Christianity, you know, God or the good. Um, the wisdom that redeems the world is also the wisdom by which the world is created. This follows from the doctrine of the Incarnation and the Trinity. It's not as if Jesus is an afterthought. So that the very idea of creation is itself a theological idea, a theological concept that suggests that Everything that is has its being in the second person of the Trinity, the wisdom that creates. For that reason, it seems to me that we have to be open to a certain kind of pagan wisdom because the wisdom uh, the wisdom will be found in uh, places that might appear to be unlikely. And I think we see this in everyday life. You know, we see people who are who are in many ways embody the wisdom of God sometimes even better than, you know, uh, our, our fellow believers. And how do you account for that? Uh, people who, who, you know, who affirm nonviolence, people who uh, take pleasure over reconciliation, people who learn to forgive one another, people who act justly, people concerned with inequality. All of those things are not just the province of, uh, of people who've been redeemed by the wisdom that creates the world. And I, so I do think that you can find in pagan, you don't have to be defensive or fearful of pagan wisdom, precisely because it's, uh, uh, in some sense, it, it's, it's related to the wisdom by which God creates everything. All right, and then as far as the biblical narrative, you spend a lot of time there. So I'd like to hear this in, in some detail, especially the Old Testament uh, story, Genesis, the first 11 chapters, the call of Abraham, the Ten Commandments, um, the Ark of the Covenant, up through the monarchy starting. So those are some real key things that you in, very interestingly use as a, a background to develop Christian ethics. I think the crucial question one should put to Holy Scripture. And mind you, I think the question 
you put to Holy Scripture makes all the difference. If you put the wrong question to Scripture, you're going to get foolish answers. If you go to Genesis 1 and ask questions of astrophysics and cosmology in a scientific sense, you're going to miss the whole point of Genesis 1, where, you know, the sun and the the uh, um, moon aren't even created till the fourth day. So what does the day mean? Uh, Origen knew that early on in the in in the life of the church. I think the crucial question really comes in. I mean, there's there's a number of crucial questions. Of course, there's not just one, but one is in Second Samuel seven when the king gets settled in his house, King David, after Israel has wandered all this time, from the call of Abraham in Genesis twelve, until you know even into the Exodus. You know, until finally, now the king is settled in his house. And the question is, what does this now mean for the king to be settled? And David decides he's going to build God a house because he has a house. And the prophet Nathan says, do it, and doesn't consult God. But God comes that night and says to the prophet, ask David, did I, did tell David, did I ask you to build me a house? When did I ever say to you, I want a house? And then by the end of 2 Samuel 7, the question has flipped and G- and god says to david i will build you a house so the sort of crucial question here is will you david be the house of god this this is what i see the heart of the davidic covenant but it's also i think related to the abrahamic covenant and even the mosaic covenant because the question again and again in scripture and i think this is the question that jesus puts to his disciples is will you be the people of god Will you be the house of God? Will you be the city of God? So there's these resonances between people, household, city. And in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, of course, you have creation and you have fall and you have all these big stories. Uh, and then and then you have this wonderful uh, narrative about the Tower of Babel where, where the people decide to make a name for themselves and build their own city. And then God does this gracious act, destroys it, divides people up by nations and tribes and tongues and people. And then after that, calls Abraham and gives him a mission. And the Abrahamic mission is not to be like the other nations for the sake of the nations. And I find that an intriguing, an intriguing mission. So you're supposed to be, you know, not like the other nations. But not because you are, you know, uh, self-involved and prideful and somehow morally superior. You do it as a form of witness to the nations. And this is God's slow repair of a wounded creation. It begins with the Abrahamic covenant, fashioning a people. Uh, you see this with the, the development of the tabernacle, where God promises to dwell with the people in the Ark of the Covenant, and then ultimately with the temple in the Davidic covenant, Uh, you have the exile. And uh, with the exile, there's this real sense of loss and lament. You get Psalm 137, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Uh, You know, the old Babylon, you devastator, happy are they who take your children and dash them upon the rocks, which is not a psalm we often chant in church, maybe for good reason. Um, But so, so there's this sense that we're supposed to be a people, a light to the nations, a city set on the hill. Uh, this is what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, his people are called to be. And in, in one sense, Jesus' ministry is the is the is this ongoing mission of preparing a people for God by gathering 12, a clear sign of restoration, marching towards Jerusalem, the place where God promises to dwell with God's people and the people with God. And we see that in the very claim that we make as a, a people of faith, that in Jesus you see divinity and humanity working together in complete harmony and one. And now our task is to participate in that and uh, to bear witness to it. So, you know, that's a kind of overarching narrative of Scripture. There's a lot, of, of course, there's a great deal there that would uh, uh, would still need to be addressed and uh, explicated. But uh, that, at least in this book and in my work in general, that sort of arc of the narrative is what I think is essential when we think about the uh, Christian ethics. I found it very interesting that in such a short book, you spent so much time on the Ark of the Covenant. So why was that particularly interesting to you? I I wrote a commentary on Hebrews uh, for the belief series. And uh, uh, so I did uh, quite a bit of study in uh, uh, Second Temple Judaism. But also, I think, because 
in what in what's called temple Christology, you see in the ark that, that that there's this there's this interesting tension or paradox that the God of the universe, who is infinite and inexhaustible and cannot be contained in a space, God who is infinite, and that just you know beggars the mind. What does it mean to say that God is without limit, but God is it you know is is a, a an acting agent how can, how is that even possible it, it's just uh something i can't I can't conceive hardly but this god who is infinite is nonetheless found located in finite e- existence without without sacrificing transcendence or infinitude so you have god present in the burning bush without it being consumed speaking through it you have God present in the Ark of the Covenant, first in the tabernacle, then in the, the um, temple. You have God present in the womb of the Virgin Mary, who is often depicted herself as a kind of Ark of the Covenant. And then you have God at one uh, with humanity in Jesus. So I think the Ark of the Covenant conveys to us what Christianity is about, which is not not saving individual souls from a world that's going to be destroyed. Uh, that's more like a kind of bad Platonism. It's precisely about God and creatures dwelling together in unity, a new heaven and a new earth, where the two come together, the wolf lies down with the lamb, everyone, like Isaiah 65 says, you know, the wolf lies down with the lamb, everyone eats from the work of their own labor, no one, uh, no one just profits off another, uh, you know, this, there's this image of a new creation, and, and that's what God is bringing about, not just saving individual souls. So that became, when I when I began to see that in Scripture and in uh, the theological tradition, it opened up my eyes, and I find it just uh, very, uh, very illuminating. And Jesus, of course, has to be at the center of uh, Christian ethics. So how do you uh, see the life of Jesus, his ministry, his teachings, his death and his resurrection? How do you see them informing our Christian ethics? I begin with the core practice that we worship Jesus as God without confusing divinity and humanity. Uh, And from that core, because I think that's what we do when we gather for worship, and that's crucial. From that core worship, uh, from that core practice of worship, we then begin to recognize some things, that Jesus is important both for who he is and what he has done. And those two cannot be easily separated. What he has done is made significant because of who he is, and who he is is significant because of what he has done. So uh, in gathering the Twelve, in the crucifixion, in the resurrection, and the exaltation, um, we see who he is, and who he is gives then a new valence to his his teachings, his ministry, his life. Uh, so we pay attention to his teachings, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the Beatitudes, um, uh, his the, the claims that he makes, um, precisely because what they demonstrate to us is uh, this relationship between who he is and what he has done. The Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes is, is, is the life of blessedness that he conveys and that life is actually the life that he himself lives. If you look at the Beatitudes, you realize they're almost, they're, they're autobiographical. They're who he is. So he discloses to us not only what it means to be divine, but also what it means to be human. And, uh, you know, his, his refusal uh, to use violence against his enemies, his refusal um, uh, to, to lash out uh, in hatred. Uh, his concern for um, the poor, the vulnerable, Uh, all of these things convey to us uh, who God is, but also what it means to be human. Irenaeus says, the glory of God is a human person fully alive. And you see that in the transfiguration, where here is the, 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 the glorification of humanity, where God and creatures dwell together with such transparency that it literally uh, shines. And uh, then you mentioned uh, the Beatitudes and the call of Abraham. How do you see the Beatitudes as a fulfillment of the call of Abraham to bless the nations? The Beatitudes give us, in a sense, what the city of God, what a proper answer to this question, 
uh, how do you not be like the nations for the sake of the nations? What the form of an answer to that looks like. It's found in the Beatitudes. Mercy, peacemakers, a thirst for justice. All of those, the, the, the seven Beatitudes suggest that um, uh, uh, here, here's the purpose of the law. So when Jesus says, you know, uh, uh, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I think that in some sense, the Beatitudes are the fulfillment of the law. They're, they're why you would have the kind of law that you have. So the eighth Beatitude is persecution for the sake of righteousness, which is a very strange Beatitude because you wouldn't think of, you know, persecution as a Beatitude. It doesn't make you happy. Uh, but I think it does suggest something uh, uh, sort of counterintuitive, and that is, we often look for successful Christianity, the mega church, you know, mm. uh, the celebrity pastor, uh, you know, the church that can conquer and be victorious. Uh, but what we find in the Beatitudes that Christianity exists in places that are unlikely. There, they exist in places where uh, uh, people might even find themselves not in power, but on the opposite end of power. Uh, so I, I think if you now, now, I don't think this, of course, is. Uh, uh, I, always the case but in a world that's broken and wounded embodying the life of of god present in christ uh, will will look odd it will be a threat it will be viewed as uh uh something less than successful and then jesus makes statements like uh, if you don't take up the cross you're not worthy of me if you don't die to yourself, you're not worthy of me. So how is the cross and then the resurrection central to Christian ethics? Right. The cross, for me, is Christ's enthronement as, as ruler of the world. It is, it, it is an enthronement. Uh, it, it was supposed to be a, a parody of an enthronement, but it is an actual enthronement. So what you see is you see the, the exemplar of what a ruler of, this, of the world is supposed to look like. Uh, and it's not found in someone who comes with, uh, you know, sword and uh, a power, but it comes with someone uh, who takes on the suffering of the cross. And then that life gets vindicated. You know, I mean, so, so in that sense, you know, Luther said, God is dead and we have killed him. And Nietzsche takes that up. Um, and and uh, but but Nietzsche doesn't have the next step. And that is the vindication of the resurrection. So the way of life does get vindicated. It's not just, it's not a celebration of death. It's not as if death is the answer. Uh, the, the crucifixion, I mean, suffering, death are not ends in themselves. They don't give our life meaning in that sense. They are at best a way to love that then gets vindicated through the new life that comes about through resurrection. That's why you could take the risk of those things. Otherwise, you would just be a masochist. Right. It gives people the hope to live uh, dangerously, to live all out for Jesus, knowing that there's the hope of the resurrection. Yes, exactly. Which it makes it harder, harder for those, the powers that be, to hold down the people under them if, if these people have that sort of radical hope. That's right. And when you think about the history of Christianity, especially in the first few centuries, you know, if you looked at, uh, at, the, at the Romans and the Christians at that time, you would have never thought that this, this group of people would be the ones uh, who would uh, be victorious. Uh, and, the, and, you know, and then they also come into their own power and, and um, uh, that, that power becomes uh, abusive and oppressive. Uh, and God doesn't act and takes it away from them, you know, and, and then they have to, we, we have to constantly relearn this lesson again and again and again. All right, and we'll get more into that later. So how does Christian liturgy function in relation to ethics, including baptism and penance? Right. I think there's a threefold movement in the Christian life. It, the first movement of the Christian life is baptism, where you do do a form of repentance. There's a there's even a kind of, uh, uh, you know, a throwing off of, uh, of uh, sin, uh, the woundedness of creation. And then you're baptized into the life of Christ. So uh, it's a participation in Christ's perfection. It's a death and a life. I mentioned I was baptized by the Anabaptists. I remember my baptism it was by this farmer preacher with big hands who, who, who stuck me under the water and held me there till I thought I was dead and then brought me back to life. Uh, so, you know, so that... <laughs> 
Baptism is a one-time event. It's a work that God does in us by the Spirit, uh, which allows us to participate in Christ's perfection. We are dead to sin and born again to new life. Uh, and that's how it should be. Uh, however, sin persists. Uh, so sin after baptism, while it was an issue in the early church, it's not for us. We we sort of assume it. And um, uh, repentance is the way we deal with that. We learn how to confess the ways in which our life is not yet free from the very things that our baptism freed us from. So I think confession, learning to confess, and finding out what what to confess. Sometimes, you know, when we're young, our confession of sin might be about things that are rather trivial. Uh, later, we discover things that capture us uh, that are, uh, you know, much uh, much more damnable because they they break communion with other human beings. They break communion with creation itself. So we learn how to confess those things, and we do acts of repentance uh, to try to discover the the if you will the virtues that allow us to be restored as new creatures. And then that's celebrated in the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, which is this feast of reconciliation, this communion where God and creatures come to exist uh, once again as one. So we move from our baptism through repentance, celebrating Eucharist, which is a movable feast that can be done again and again and again, precisely because the entirety of the Christian life is learning how to live into our baptism. And uh, how about uh, adoration, worship, singing? How would that be part of ethics or influence it? All of those things matter precisely because they show us how to live in the world in such a way that we can um, uh, hopefully see as God sees. Like, why do we pray? We don't pray only because we're always begging for something. We pray so that we might see the way the world is uh, in God's eyes. Uh, why do we sing hymns so that we can join in uh, the praise that is going on to God, not because God is some narcissist who uh, who needs our praise, uh, but precisely because God is the perfection of goodness itself. And by praising that, we, in some sense, uh, participate in it. I find hymnody uh, and singing one of the most important ways we reflect the triune image. Because in singing... Everyone can participate at the same time, and rather than cacophony, rather than confusion, you hear harmony, melody, unity. So I don't think it's any surprise that we, when we gather, we sing. I think it's imperative, and it's the closest thing we have uh, to, to Trinity. I mean, the, only the preacher can preach, because if everybody speaks at the same time, you don't have unity. But uh, everybody can sing. Everybody can recite uh, hymns, psalms, uh, prayers, and uh, you have this sort of, uh, uh, you know, unity in diversity, uh, which in, in one way is, is what the Holy Trinity, is, it, I think it's what it means to be made in the image of God. So let's move on to some more uh, specific um, movements in ethics. Uh, Luther and the Lutherans, what is it about their ethics that made you want to mention them? Well, I thought it was important to just have a brief account of various traditions of ethics and recognize the differences and similarities. Uh, Luther, unlike, say, the Thomas, Luther did not have a lot of affection for Aristotle and the virtue tradition. Uh, he thought it could easily lead to a form of works righteousness. And, you know, not without some uh, merit in that criticism. Um, Lutherans also say, unlike uh, my own Wesleyan tradition and even the Anglican tradition, uh, are worried more about uh, a perfectionist ethic. Uh, so there's a focus on being at the same time sinful and uh, righteous. And uh, you know, there's more of a kind of a, at least in some Lutheran strands, there's more of a kind of a dialectical between them rather than the idea of progress towards perfection. So I just thought it would be useful to see the differences. Uh, and, and mind you, none of these traditions, only, you know, when we talk about the Lutheran ethic or the Anglican ethic, uh, they're all con forms of fields of contestation. There's all kinds of disagreements even within these traditions. Uh, but but where you are located in one of these traditions, 
will influence the way you think about uh, the moral life. So is there a weakness in the Lutheran tradition um, in terms of uh, promoting sanctification because they're more focused on we're forgiven, we'll always be sinners? I would say there is in what's known as the radical Lutherans. Uh, the idea that I think there's a real lack of sanctification among the, the radical Lutherans where your righteousness is only forensic. Uh, it's not true, say, of the... the uh, uh, there's a there's a new group of uh, Lutheran ethicists that come out of the Scandinavian countries, which says, in fact, Luther does have a strong doctrine, not only of sanctification, but even deification. And mm. uh, you know, so there's a Luther is like St. Augustine. He wasn't a systematic thinker. You know, he wasn't a philosopher who tried to make sure that everything he said was coherent. I had a professor who once tell, told me that you could find any position in Augustine you wanted if you just look long enough, because he wrote so much on so many different themes. I think there's some truth to that uh, about Luther as well. I, I think you can get Luther wrong like you can get Augustine wrong. But, uh, you know, when you have two uh, very strong Lutheran traditions, uh, one that emphasizes deification and one that only emphasizes forensic uh, justification, and they both find precedence in Luther, um, I think that says that... Um, you know, that these things are ongoing uh, uh, questions of, of debate and discussion. And what is interesting about the Anglican ethical tradition? Yeah, I'm quite a fan of the Anglicans, but then I'm a Wesleyan, so John Wesley was an Anglican, and, and uh, uh, I've written a book on Wesley's moral theology. Um, Wesley himself taught Aristotle uh, when he was at Oxford. So there is a tradition in the Anglican moral theologians, which is less Lutheran, in that there's more of a place for a kind of pagan wisdom, that you learn something from Aristotle. And it's coupled often with uh, Thomas Aquinas. What I like about the Anglican moral theology, and I think it's underrepresented in our thought today, uh, is that... Um, uh, you can find in Anglicanism a, a, a retrieval of Thomas Aquinas, who in the 13th century really invented, well, well, helped helped give a, a definite form to moral theology. But in the modern era, Thomas often gets used for reactionary purposes. Uh, he's used to just react against everything modern as if everything modern is corrupt, and if we only retrieve the Middle Ages, everything would be fine. What you find in some Anglican moral theology is a use of Thomas that's not reactionary. Uh, one of my favorite theologians these days, and he's playing a major role in this next book that builds on uh, Christian ethics, a very, uh, a very short introduction, is F.D. Morris who was a fascinating thinker and wrote this thousand page book called Moral and Metaphysical uh, a Philosophy. And I think he's a kind of non-reactionary Thomist who recognizes the beauty of the virtue tradition, but situates it within the life of the church and the kingdom of God. All right then, and how about the Anabaptists? You're, you've got some background there yourself, so why are they important? They remind us of the hard saying of Jesus and that we can't just dismiss them uh, as if they're somehow a private ethic. And then we, when we go into the public sphere, we, we do something else. They remind us of the importance of being a community. They, they challenge all the other churches on their habits of authority and power. Because uh, not that the Anabaptists haven't misused their power as well. We can all point to uh, evidence that they in fact have. But they challenge the idea that somehow the church's task is to make common cause with the authorities and rulers. Uh, so I, I still find that, and I think even more so uh, in the last, uh, you know, since 2015, the anti-Constantinian criticism of Christianity that comes out of the Anabaptist tradition, not only the Anabaptist tradition, it's others as well, but I think that has now become imperative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that will always be relevant. <laughs> All right, so uh, a lot of ethical traditions are just seem to be focused on, you know, what does God, what does Jesus tell us to do and not to do, right? And they want to dispense with a lot of other uh, categories. So mission and ecclesiology, the church and what the church does, how are they um, 
how are they the context for uh, understanding ethics? That arises from the work of the 20th century reform theologian Karl Barth, that ethics is in a great deal uh, has to do with the question of witness and what ecclesiology and mission provide. Now, Bart didn't always have the strongest account of ecclesiology, but uh, what what Christians do is witness. And of course, that was taken up and uh, emphasized by my own teacher, Stanley Hauerwas, who wants to argue that this is the heart of Christian ethics, that uh, you have to have a community that can witness uh, to the, the new reality that Christ has brought about. And if you don't have that, then in fact, uh, Christian ethics just becomes an abstraction that uh, you might as well just use, you know, utilitarianism or deontology or virtue or something. Uh, but you need this community that has a viable and credible witness. <clears throat> All right. And so you spent a lot of time on uh, modern and postmodern thinkers, um, Mill and Kant and Nietzsche. So if you could spend uh, going to some detail about how that ethics came about from that secular movement and then how we need to respond in terms of our understanding theological ethics, how do we respond to that? I, I think, uh, and I learned this from Alistair McIntyre, the philosopher, every ethic implies a sociology. That's a quote from McIntyre. Every ethics implies a sociology. And that means that ethics is not just a politically innocent activity. If you adopt an ethic, you're also adopting a kind of social order, a statement about the way you think the world is and should be. So it should be as no, no surprise that John Stuart Mill's Ethics of Utilitarianism uh, fits quite well with his work uh, in the uh, as a global trader in the East Indies Company, or that Kant's ethic on deontology fits well and is taken up nicely by John Rawls as an ethics of the nation state. Now, that doesn't mean those ethics are incorrect or corrupt or there's nothing to learn from them, but it means that you can't be naive when you teach them, when you think about them, because you're inviting people to construe their lives according to these social orders. And that and that should be a live question. Should your first uh, allegiance be to uh, to a global market? Should your first allegiance even be to a nation state? Is that what allows you to flourish as a human being? Uh, is that a lot, what allows you to uh, become a, a human being fully alive? Um, and of course, we need those. I, I'm not saying we don't need such uh, social orders, but uh, the question of, of Christian ethics and its relationship to, to modern and, and even a postmodern ethic would be a question of which social orders are going to render your life intelligible. Now, Nietzsche is fascinating because... Um, Nietzsche, I think, I mean, I, I'm not a big fan of the new atheists. I find them boring and predictable. I sometimes uh, uh, think if we had better theology, maybe we'd have better atheists today. I don't know why we get such bad atheists today. But Nietzsche, I find a fascinating atheist precisely because he recognizes that when you when you get rid of God, you're getting rid of a great deal more. So, you know, Nietzsche thought we were at the twilight of the idols when God would be dead. But he also thought we were be, then beyond good and evil. And so you get people who are gleefully anti-theological, uh, you know, who want to police theology even out of the modern university. But they don't follow Nietzsche all the way. They're not gleefully anti-ethics. Uh, and Nietzsche even predicted this when he said, uh, those who reject God cling all the more tightly to ethics. Mm -hmm. It's because it's all you have. You know, if there's no God to forgive you, all you have is your own ethical ability to save yourself in the world. And I find that, uh, I, I would find that a counsel of despair. Um, so so I think those things, thinking with those thinkers, you you see things, you learn things. Uh, and I think that's important. To, and, and, and again, I'm not suggesting that everything Mill or Kant or Rawls wrote is somehow uh, suspect. I don't think it is. There's things always to learn. There's things to learn from Nietzsche. Um, but the question of which social order is going to render your life intelligible is for me the pressing theological question. And of course, it should be not just the church, but 
the kingdom of God, this this new reality that God, we hope, is bringing about. Heidegger once said, only a God can save us now. And um, I don't know exactly what he meant by that, but uh, I often, when I think about the issues we face today, uh, and I don't mean to be a counsel of despair because the despair is a, a vice against hope, but um, uh, I, I don't know if I could have hope if I didn't also have this sense that uh, God can yet do a work that will be surprising. And our task is to witness and participate in it. And what was uh, Kant's role in the development of secular ethics? Yeah, Kant, Kant gave us... Um, I mean, Kant was a religious thinker. So I wouldn't... I don't know if I would say his ethics is fully secular. It's not as secular as, say, something like um, Henry Sidgwick's ethics, I think, was. But Kant gave us a way of thinking about ethics in terms of what's usually called deontology, which has a place for God, but renders God rather um, a tangential. And um, so once God gets sort of pushed to the side where what God does is finally in the end to make sure everything comes out all right, um, it doesn't seem as though God actually has a lot of purpose given per, uh, purchase in everyday life, given what Kant says about uh, the categorical imperative that he sets forth as the, the heart of ethics. And so given these movements, the modernist, postmodern movement, and what Christians are experiencing today, what we're facing in the Western world, uh, what do we really need to focus on in order to make sure that um, we're grounded in good theology and in the scriptures? Um, I think on maintaining communities of worship that are more interested in worship than being entertained, uh, I think we should focus upon, um, I think perhaps there's too much focus on sex and sexuality and not enough focus on questions of money, power, politics, and violence. You know, there's seven, there's seven, roughly seven statements in all of scripture on homosexuality. The number of statements on economics and violence and power are just, you know, a thousand times more than that. But if you look about what seems to be the pressing issues for most people, uh, we just get hung up on a, a few things. And uh, I think we don't see the fuller picture. Right. Wouldn't that be the case, though, that at different times, God needs to address different issues? At the time for, I guess for pagans at that time, sexuality was a big deal for the Gentiles, but for the Jews, it wasn't as crucial an issue. Yeah, that could be. That could be. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, providence has a way of, of ordering things and bringing about new things and uh, uh, helping us forget things that should be forgotten. All right. So speaking of sex and money and power, uh, you spend the, the end of the book focusing on those three in that order. So uh, what is it about sex and sex sexuality? Do we just need to remember that sexual expression is to be for between one man and one woman in committed marriage and then everything else falls into place? Or how do you see it? Well, I think I think um, what, what, I, what I usually say is let's not forget that sex is also about politics and economics. So don't mix body fluids until you mix bank accounts. And uh, if you can mix bank accounts, then mix body fluids. So, you know, I don't want to make uh, too big a deal about uh, uh, which particular form of sexuality we should affirm at the present moment. Um, but I would say that never forget that whatever we affirm, it has to do with an economic and political reality that you can't just think of sex as recreational. Um, as, as enjoyable as it is, don't get me wrong, you know, pleasure is a good thing that God has given us. But um, that's, I mean, if, if I have a sexual ethics that I like to just say, don't mix body fluids until you mix bank accounts. Okay, so uh, that makes sense. If you're going to be have a spouse, it's good to share money. But what do you mean by the political when in this context? By the political, I mean that um, uh, sex is also always about power. It's about uh, uh, how you relate to another human being within a, a community. And you can't assume that uh, it's just an, an innocent, neutral activity. So it has to be accountable. And it has to be accountable to something other than yourself. And I think that's what marriage at its best uh, 
should be. Marriage is a it's a monastic form of life where you forsake all others and you know you learn the virtue of fidelity to another human being. Um, and uh, I think uh, in so doing, you're accountable to not just the two of you, but also uh, to the potentiality of children, to your friends, to the church community, uh, and even, you know, I mean, even even to neighborhoods, you know, um, good faithful relations help create stable neighborhoods. And anybody who's lived in an unstable neighborhood knows how important stable neighborhoods are. All right. So I've never heard uh, marriage referred to as monastic, but can you say more about that? Yeah, uh, you have to learn to curb your desires so that uh, when you say you're going to take this person and forsake all others, it's a it's a kind of asceticism where you have to say, you know, uh, despite what my desire might be, um, uh, I'm going to learn to direct and order my desire to love this one person over a lifetime, um, which is a kind of virtuous activity, I believe that also requires the assistance of the Holy Spirit, those infused virtues. Uh, faith and fidelity is a virtue that comes uh, both uh, through our own actions and, and habituation over time, but also through the action of God. And I guess rather than making a, a, a vow of obedience to the abbot, um, you consult with your spouse. Yeah, you don't just right. make decisions on your own. Right. I had a Catholic priest friend tell me one time, look, if I mess up, and violate my vow of celibacy. I don't destroy a family life. If you mess up and destroy your vow, you destroy a family life. And that was actually mm. quite insightful. It was his way of saying to me, we both have taken certain vows, ascetic vows. Now, maybe it shouldn't be called monastic. That might be, uh, perhaps we should give that a more technical sense. But I do think both are forms of ascetic life, uh, which, are, which are ordered towards a kind of uh, a perfection, uh, which take time because you don't learn overnight uh, how to be faithful to a person in all its all components. Right. All right. And uh, money, finances, you talk about sharing, holding things in common, justice, and even capitalism. Yeah. So how do you make this, um, how do you see ethics functioning in this realm? If, if less needs to be said about sex today, more needs to be said about money. I think we have to address questions of, uh, of uh, uh, income inequality, of uh, global inequity, of the way profit gets generated and distributed. Uh, and I think those are not uh, indifferent to Scripture. Those are straight out of the formation of the community in Acts 2 and Acts 4 where a sign of God's presence is that there's no poor among us and uh, everyone who has what they have do not do not consider it as their own, but are willing mm -hmm. to share it. Doesn't mean there has to be a common possessions per se. I mean, I think that's fine. I know that too can go bad. I've seen that go bad. Um, it doesn't mean that we need, you know, the state to come in and c claim all our property for the revolution. Um, but I do think it means that there has to be a willingness to recognize that everything that we have is a gift and ha and we have to be open to sharing it uh, within all of the other commitments that we also have. So uh, I think that could be done much better these days uh, simply by uh, being more open to, to the money we make. And um, I don't think the problem is making the money per se. In that sense, I'd be like, it, it, it depends. Uh, it depends on, uh, you know, you shouldn't make your money unjustly off the off the proceeds of others. Um, I also think we could be involved. Uh, F.D. Morris, who was the father of Christian socialism, was very involved at, in the 1850s at what he called cooperatives, where um, workers would come together and they would uh, do profit sharing. And uh, so that you didn't have, you know, owners who were gaining from the profits who would then impose managers who try to discipline labor by paying them as little as possible so that the profits can be maximized. Uh, we need some kind of cooperative sharing that challenges that. And I think the church should be involved in that. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of that, but um, uh, F.D. Morris and, and that whole tradition of the Anglican Christian socialists give me a great sense of hope. I see some retrieval of that uh, today, and uh, I think that's a salutary thing. So uh, what would you say about capitalism then? 
Uh, I think it's deeply problematic uh, um, in many of its com components. Uh, obviously, I mean, I think it's 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 true that it's the most productive form of uh, economics uh, that we've we've yet yet had. But um, uh, it it the way profit is distributed, and the assumption that you know that you can't you can't distribute it any other way than the way it's currently distributed, or you will do away with incentives. Uh, the incentive to work and create and be a, you know an entrepreneur. I never use the word entrepreneur if I can avoid it. Um, I think all of those things are just deeply flawed, and they're just a justification for inequalities that don't have to be there. Um, you know, I, I do try to read a great deal in political economy and uh, try to see what's going on. I'm not an economist, so I have to. I I'm, I want to learn from others. It does seem. It just seems to me it's a myth. The, the myth of work in our culture, the myth that work somehow pulls you out of poverty. And if you just work harder, you'll overcome poverty. That's just not true. Uh, it's not, it's not, it's, uh, you know, if you work for a living versus if you invest for a living, your proceeds, the profit as, as uh, the return that you're going to receive from that uh, differs so uh, disproportionately that, uh, you know, people who invest for a living get to play golf and people who work for a living have to have three jobs to try to get by. And it just seems to me that's not the way you'd want to construct a society that in any ways bears witness to what we hope the new creation will be. All right. And finally, then, uh, your section on power, which uh, has to do with violence. And you ask the question, should Christians rule? And if so, how? So if you could go into some detail about your, your thoughts here relating to power and tie this back into the Anabaptists and the Sermon on the Mount as well, particularly I'm thinking of Jesus' command to love our enemies. I think the perhaps the first thing that Christians should always remind themselves of is that uh, uh, Christ is the ruler uh, and we see how he gets um, um, coronated as king in the crucifixion. And so whatever account of rule that we have, if it doesn't look something like that, it's uh, corrupt. Um, so should Christians rule um, only by accident, I would say, and on rare occasions? I, would, I do think, uh, you know, that I've learned a great deal from the Anabaptists about the anti-Constantinian character of the Christian life, that we don't need to rule, and sometimes the desire to rule is really a certain form of uh, practical atheism. Like, if we don't rule, then, you know, God's not going to be in charge, but if we're in charge, then God's in charge. There was this foolish senator from Florida, state senator, who when Donald Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem says, now Jesus can come back. And you think, really? I mean, he honestly said that. Really? Jesus' ability to, to return is predicated upon our political machinations? You know, that just seems to me to, to be uh, a form of atheism. So I think sometimes the desire to rule is precisely a lack of faith in the one who does rule. It doesn't mean that we don't want good rulers or we want to just accept any kind of rule. Clearly, we don't want that. Um, I, and I do think when it comes to the questions of peace and nonviolence, if if you've ever lived in a neighborhood that was violent, you know how miserable that can be. It's, it's a horrific way to live. I lived next to a crack house uh, for three years when my kids were little, and it was a very vicious and violent neighborhood. And um, I think... Sometimes the question of rule is the wrong question because we think, well, how do we how do we gain the levers and power of the nation state? But there's another way to think about it, which is more local, and that is how do we create neighborhoods that are peaceful and flourishing and filled with joy and not fear? And if we could do that at the local level, who knows how it might bubble up, uh, you know, because things don't seem to trickle down very well, but maybe it could bubble up. And you learn how to do that in a neighborhood, then you learn how to do that in a city, then you learn how to do that in 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 in, in a larger larger way. Uh, so I think I think the question, even the question of pacifism and and just war, which are more on a continuum for me, in that um, they both share a presumption for peace, and peace is more basic to our being than violence, uh, because we reflect the image of God. I think that uh, that question should be posed at the level of. 
uh, of of neighbors first and only then uh, you know only then ask questions of well what do we do with the united states military i don't know what to do with the united states military i'm not in control um uh so uh i don't i don't know if that gets to that question or not it's a it's a tough one so um to make it practical um could a Christian ever be in charge of uh, over, say, a police force or a military where uh, the use of lethal violence is to be expected? I would have a hard time answering that question, yes. And um, um, precisely because it's the question of lethal violence. Now, if there were, there might be forms of non lethal. Uh, coercion and force that uh, would be permissible, and right. um, um, but in as much as our expectation is that we have to take the lives of other human beings, um, that seems to me to be very difficult to square with um, uh, what Christ has called us to be. Into. Right. It seems to me I could be a policeman or I could be the head of chief of police as long as the police force was committed to non-lethal violence. Right. Right. And, even, and uh, yeah, and even the the most rigorous forms of just war would assume that um, the point is to incapacitate uh, an unjust aggressor, to incapacitate them, which is not necessarily uh, the desire to kill them. I mean, there are unjust aggressors in the world, and uh, we we can't just look the other way. Um, I think of uh, the group of people called the Copperheads during the Civil War, the Northerners who didn't want anything to do with liberating the slaves. And so, uh, you know, so they just, you know, they, they and, and I'm not I'm not suggesting that uh, the only way to liberate the slaves um, uh, was through war. But, um, uh, the, you know, you had to be on the side of the liberation of the slaves. It was a horrific, horrific uh, Slavocracy that we had. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have a lot of respect for what they called the Copperheads at the time. I think hmm. they just looked the other way. But then again, you had people like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and, and others who, uh, you know, who did tremendous. We need to, we need to look to them, I think, uh, for the way we think about this, these forms of uh, abolitionist Christianity that uh, seek to undo uh, some of this deep wounds of, uh, uh, of oppression that still haunt us. So when it comes to influencing uh, the state or, you know, local police force, those, you know, bodies that would use lethal violence, um, what would you encourage the church to do? How, what's the best way to, to protest or to witness against? Yeah. Uh, to be courageous, to put ourselves in circumstances where, um, uh, where we don't look the other way at uh, at the violence around us, um, where we try to assist those who are as best we can, uh, who are the uh, uh, unjust uh, recipients of uh, oppression and violence. Um, but I think we also have to be very careful about uh, summoning uh, the police force, uh, and and not because you know individual police aren't good and decent and respectable people. I'm not saying that. But the entire system is not built to protect, um, you know, the 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 weak and the vulnerable. Uh, so uh, how do how do we create systems and structures where the purpose of something like uh, policing uh, would be to take care of those persons uh, as opposed to just secure property? Right, and that's probably the first place, when I think about it at a practical level, if I was faced with a situation where I felt my life was in danger or people close to me, would I call the police? Yeah. And I like to think of it as, well, I would call the police, but I would call them to help intercede nonviolently. Right. And that's like, Dennis, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's not how they're trained. So I'm kind of uh, maybe I'm a hypocrite in my pacifism because I want them to come, but I want them to do it my way. Well, we're all hypocrites in our in our pacifism. So uh, uh, but uh, fortunately, hypocrites always have a place with Jesus. So uh, he takes us on. <laughs> right. And so maybe the answer in that case then is to be consistent is like 
No, I won't call the police. If I, have, if I know some people that are trained nonviolently and willing to intervene nonviolently, right, right. I can call them. Exactly. And I tend, I tend not to call the police. Uh, I try very hard not to. I don't think I do at all anymore. Um, although, you know, again, anybody could be in a, a tragic situation where, uh, 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 where your options are all bad. I mean, um, that's, that is part of the fragility of this life. There are tragic situations uh, where somebody's going, to, somebody's going to be harmed, somebody's going to die, um, even. And, um, I, you know, what, what would you do? In, uh, I, I don't think those marginal cases should be the cases that give us our everyday ethic. Otherwise, exactly. we'd be like people in, you know, we'd, we'd walk around all the time with arms and and be prepared at any moment to uh, take out the bad guys, which would be a horrible way to live. Right. And then you'd lose the you'd lose that peaceable neighborhood. Right. Right. OK, well, that's a good place to uh, finish. So, um, Dr. Long, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. It was really it was really a pleasure to think through some of these things. I'm, I'm very grateful to you, Dennis. So I appreciate it very much. All right. Well, I'm Dennis Metzler. You've been listening to The Charge. Uh, we've been taking a look at Christian Ethics with Dr. Stephen Long, D. Stephen Long. And so check out his book. It's linked below, Christian Ethics, a very short introduction. And what's the, the name of your new book that will be coming out? It's tentatively titled Infusing Virtue on Learning and Teaching Ethics. All righty. Okay. Well, peace to everyone. I'd love to hear from you. Please email me at thecharge.info at gmail.com. Please check out our other videos. Don't forget to hit like and click subscribe.